Welcome, then, to this final session, a session that I will title Critical Genealogies. In this session, I will address the question, what good is genealogy for praxis? And I'll begin where Friedrich Nietzsche began in 1873. In any case, I hate everything that merely instructs me without augmenting or directly invigorating my activity. It is with those words of Goethe, you will recall, that the young Friedrich Nietzsche, barely 29 years old, opens his untimely meditation on history, or more specifically, as he writes, on the value of history. It is those words that would guide Nietzsche in his early writings towards the concept of critical history as one way, among others, of using history to help, in his words, implant in ourselves a new habit, a new instinct, a second nature, so that our first nature withers away. It is those words of Goethe that would ultimately need Nietzsche 15 years later and shortly before he lost his mind to craft and deploy the term genealogy and crown it in the title of one of his last great books on the genealogy of morals. And it is that spirit that inspired Gilles Deleuze and Michel Foucault, first conceptually and then practically, respectively, to birth the genealogical method of critique. Now today, the genealogical approach within critical philosophy has grown to the point where it has become practically hegemonic in critical circles. Almost anyone today who has a theoretical bone and works with historically inflected critique refers to their work as genealogy rather than history. In homage to Foucault, critical thinkers will speak of histories of the present, but it has become practically flack-footed today to write history. Critical thinkers no longer do that. We write genealogies. The genealogical method of critique born with Deleuze and Foucault in the 1960s has triumphed, at least within certain critical circles. And as genealogy has proliferated, critical philosophers have done important work analyzing and distinguishing between different types of genealogical method and classifying thinkers within those typologies. Amy Allen, Colin Koopman, Daniele Lorenzini, Martin Zarr, among others, as well as Bernard Williams, have clarified the different styles and functioning of different types of genealogy, distinguishing four major types. First, those that serve to validate or vindicate their object of study by tracing its origins to noble or valuable roots. This is often associated with Bernard Williams. Second, those that debunk a practice or institution by unearthing, by contrast, the dark origins of those words and things. This one is often associated with Nietzsche. Third, that serve to problematize, in the words of Colin Koopman and Amy Allen. In other words, to raise questions about objects that we had come to accept and no longer question. Allen and Koopman associate this type of genealogy with Deleuze and Foucault. And fourth, as an alternative interpretation of problematization proposed by Daniele Lorenzini, those genealogies that possibilize, that open possibilities of different ways of being and thinking and offer normative direction. This analytic work is particularly timely given that we now live in an age where, among critical thinkers, the term genealogy has effectively eclipsed history. And the taxonomies, 
have helped clarify the different ways that genealogical work can operate, which is crucial to the task of critical philosophy. But they have, too often, pitted one type of genealogy against another. Too often as well, they have served to cabin or contain critical thinkers within one delimited definition and category of genealogy. Too often, finally, they have asked us to choose and take sides in a methodological competition. In effect, the resulting philosophical debates, though helpful in ways and certainly erudite, have had the detrimental effect of displacing the true ambition of critical philosophy and pushing the conversation in a scientific, taxonomical, nosological direction. Rather than sorting critical philosophers into these taxonomies or arguing over the essence of any one of their type of genealogical method, I believe it now behooves us instead to conceive of the different types of genealogy rather as different modalities that we can draw upon to achieve the objective of critical genealogical work, namely to augment and nourish our praxis. In the same way in which the young Nietzsche described the different modalities of historical work, different ways in which history can be used, right, monumental, traditional, or antiquarian, critical. And in the very same way in which Nietzsche did not argue that any one of those three modalities should prevail, but rather that we should intentionally, willfully, consciously deploy these different modalities in combination at different times, in different contexts, to do effective historical work that brings about action, we critical thinkers must now focus on how different uses of genealogy can work together to invigorate our actions and activism. Now that practically all historical work falls under the rubric of genealogy, it is time to take a step back and ask the question of the value of genealogy. The fact is not all genealogical writings today nourish praxis, nor do all of our philosophical debates over the types of genealogical method nourish praxis. It is simply not the case that all the work today that falls under the rubric now of genealogy is oriented toward the goal of invigorating our action or achieves that objective. And so with only a slight alteration, we might say with Nietzsche that we want to serve genealogy only to the extent that genealogy serves life. Of course, I replaced history with genealogy there. Otherwise, we turn our philosophical inquiry into a science, into a positivistic, analytic, professionalized discourse that defeats the entire enterprise of critical philosophy. We begin to engage in a type of nosology, a Linnaean taxonomy in search of the true essence or objective truth of different types of genealogical methods, when in fact, we should be drawing on their multiplicity and variety, combining and deploying them as exemplars of the work we need to do for praxis. In effect, today the ubiquity of genealogy demands that we return to Nietzsche's untimely question and now once again, in a reformulated way, ask the question of the value of genealogical approaches. It is time to ask ourselves, what good is genealogy for praxis? Now, let me step back for a moment before, on the one hand, clearing the ground and then reconstructing. Let me step back and give some background, because it's imperative to start this conversation by reminding ourselves that Nietzsche, Foucault, and other genealogists were writing against the professionalization of history, against the professionalization of philosophy, and they aspired to a way of thinking that had practical effects. 
the genealogical method was born of a deep commitment to deploying philosophy towards the goal of getting us to act, to change ourselves and the world. Their critical philosophies were philosophies of action, and the genealogical method that they used at times and helped excavate was oriented towards praxis more than anything else. We fail them when we start cabining or limiting them to narrow categories or types that limit our own use of the genealogical methods. Instead, we need to think practically about how we critical thinkers deploy each and every one of those modalities of genealogy in practice-oriented direction in order to augment and nourish praxis. Foucault made it abundantly clear in his work on the genealogy of the prison, a book, of course, subtitled The Birth of the Prison. And Nietzsche also emphasized throughout all his writings and his mindful life that the genealogical impulse is oriented towards willful transformation of self and others. Foucault wrote his book on prisons for users, not for readers. He wrote his book for actors, for people who would try to change the world. In the finest Nietzschean tradition, as Foucault himself explained, you'll recall, the little volume that I would like to write on disciplinary systems, I would like it to be of use for a teacher, a warden, a magistrate, a conscientious objector. I don't write for a public. I write for users, not readers. J'écris pour des utilisateurs, non pas pour des lecteurs. Discipline and Punish was intended to spur action. It was written, it was, it was the written complement, the textual accompaniment to the organizing and activism against the prison embodied in the militancy of the Groupe d'Information sur les Prisons. It was intended to nourish and augment action by unveiling, essentially by, by revealing, by exposing the Western carceral archipelago by contrast and parallel to the Gulag archipelago. At the very heart of the book, at its core, what pulsed was the relationship between critique and praxis. As Foucault stressed in the published book, itself. And it's always important to privilege the published words. He wrote that punishment in general and the prison in particular belong to a political technology of the body is a lesson that I have learned not so much from history as from the present. In recent years, prison revolts have occurred throughout the world. The book was intended to pick up on that action and lead to action. As Foucault underscored a few years after the publication of the book, he said, what I wanted to write was a history book that would make the present situation comprehensible and possibly lead to action. If you like, I tried to write a treatise of intelligibility about the penitentiary situation. I wanted to make it intelligible and therefore criticizable. And of course, I interpret the word possibly there in that sentence as a form of modesty of reflexivity, of self-awareness. Foucault wrote for users and actors. And for him, action was what proved the success of his work. The, in his words, success of the work, he said, what proves that it worked as I had wanted it to is that it produces an experience that changes us and that leads to action. Discipline and punish in the end, you will recall, of course, ends with these words. We must hear the distant roar of the battle. Now, when one looks back at the cluster and aggregation of critique and praxis that Foucault was engaged in during the early 1970s, it's simply stunning. The organizing and activism of the Jeep, the publication of the intolerable inquiries, the writing of Discipline and Punish, the fact that the JIP, published with Gallimard Press in France on November 10, 1971, less than three months after the homicide of George Jackson, 
a 64-page tract called The Assassination of George Jackson, with a preface by the writer Jean Genet, two translations of interviews with George Jackson, three essays, including the essay L'Assassinat Camouflé, The Masked Assassination, written by Foucault, uh, Catherine von Bulow, and Daniel Defer. Just three months after it happened, abroad, in the leading French publishing house, Gallimard. I think that gives you a sense of the militant activism that was embedded in the genealogical approach. And while Foucault, Genet, Von Bulow, Defer, Deleuze, Jacques Donzelot, Daniel Rancière, and others were conducting their inquiries, writing their tracts, publishing prison writings, exposing prison conditions, publishing the words of those inside the prison, Foucault was writing his monograph, which would eventually be read, debated, critiqued, torn up, and passed through the vents and cracks of prison cells around the world. The experience in the United States of the Short Corridor Collective at the prison San Quentin during the 2010 reflects the impact of the genealogical approach. The men of the Short Corridor Collective held in solitary confinement in the SHU, the security, the secure housing unit at Pelican Bay State Prison in California uh, for allegedly being leaders of racially identified prison gangs, formed a reading group to discuss the works of Foucault, of Bobby Sands, of Cesar Chavez, of the Black Panthers and others. And although they were in isolation, unable to talk to each other, they were able to pass ripped up pages of Discipline and Punish and other books through the cracks in the walls and in the vents and read and discuss and critique these writings, leading them ultimately to formulate an understanding of their situation and the way in which the prison administration was using their racial identities to control them. It was a journey that ultimately led to the country's largest ever prison hunger strike in 2013 involving more than 30,000 women and men throughout California prisons who refused to eat as part of a series of hunger, prison hunger strikes that had begun in July 2011. The hunger strikes and aggressive litigation ultimately led to California's agreement to end independent solitary confinement, indeterminate solitary confinement based on gang affiliation. 35 years after Discipline and Punish was published, Foucault's genealogy would become literally contraband and ultimately contribute to the men of the Short Corridor Collective detained in isolation in solitary confinement in the Shu, theorizing and acting against their torturous condition, planning political mobilizations of tens of thousands of incarcerated persons, militating with the Jeep, publishing pamphlets, writing a genealogy that contributes to those revolutionary cycles, that may well be a model for critical thinking, a model that, in Nietzsche's words, or rather, in Goethe's words, augments or directly invigorates our activity. And this, of course, takes us back to Nietzsche, to his untimely meditations, to the opening passage by Goethe to the question of the value of history. And of that opening passage, the young Nietzsche wrote, its intention is to show why instruction without invigoration, why knowledge not attended by action, why history as a costly superfluity and luxury must, to use Goethe's words, be seriously hated by us. Hated because we still lack even the things we need, and the superfluous is the enemy of the necessary. Now still, by way of background, and to put it in another way, we, or at least I, need to model my genealogical work on the recent brilliant book, Abolition Feminism Now, by Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica Miners, and Beth Ritchie. In that work, they pursue what they call a critical genealogy. And so as an epigraph of today's presentation, 
I'd like to propose a paragraph from Abolition Feminism Now, where they write, we frame this book as a critical genealogy rather than a manifesto, one that emphasizes how important it is to trace political lineages. We offer a set of ideas and descriptions of unfinished practices rather than promoting rigid definitions. Our work proceeds genealogically to address subjugated histories of organizing that must inform and strengthen our present mobilization. And we contend that genealogies should always be questioned because there is always an unacknowledged reason for beginning at a certain moment in history as opposed to another, and it always matters which narratives of the present are marginalized or expunged. The exemplar today of critical genealogies that nourish praxis is abolition feminism. To summarize before I begin, not all genealogical work today encourages praxis in part because of its proliferation and now pervasiveness. It has become what history was in the 19th century. It's crucial now that we assess the value of genealogies. It's imperative that we knock on them to determine which are hollow and which are robust, which discourage and which nourish action. It is time, once again, that we do philosophy with a hammer. Let me begin then with some ground clearing. Before proceeding, I think there are a few potential misunderstandings that I'd like to set apart. Three in particular. First, then, the four types of genealogy, vindicatory, debunking, problematizing, and possibilizing, should not be treated as competing or mutually exclusive types of genealogy. One is not better than the other. One is not more critical than the other. They each can be deployed to nourish our activity. And truth be told, they were each deployed in combination and at different times by the critical thinkers to whom we have individually and uniquely and separately identified them. Rather than treat them as competing types, they are, each one of them, an integral element of critical philosophy. They don't constitute different types associated with any one critical thinker. They are instead enmeshed as multiple elements of critique. To draw an analogy, we should conceive of them as Nietzsche thought of the different styles of doing history, the monumental style, the traditional or antiquarian style, the critical style. Like those, they, different, they represent different modalities that should and are used in combination for purposes of praxis, for life, as Nietzsche would say. Now, in prior work, I had proposed a multidimensional definition of critical philosophy with six core elements. Um, and uh, I won't belabor uh, this here since uh, I spelled it out at length, um, but just recap the six elements. The first concerns the reflexivity of the critical theorist. A quintessential element of a critical philosophy is that the thinker herself question her situated and contextual historical position and epistemological understandings. The second element is the importance of ideational categories and constructs. Ways of seeing the world and acting are mediated by mental constructs, whether we call them ideologies or regimes of truth. Those shape the way we understand our environment and our actions. Third, uh, imminence, the imminence of critique. Often, but not always, we enter into the object of our analysis, into their internal logic, in order to understand them on their own terms, to find within them tensions or contradictions that will prove productive to our thought. The fourth is the idea that we are engaged in unveiling illusions, those mental constructs and categories that shape the way we understand the world. That's what's called defetishizing critique or ideology critique, but the central element here is that we engage in a task of unveiling constantly unveiling illusions that deceive us 
and have real effects. Uh, the fifth element is that critical philosophy is especially attuned to the relation between theory and practice. That, that relationship is at the core of the engagement. And the sixth element is that there is a goal of human emancipation, of liberation. The activity of critical philosophy is oriented towards the values of equality, solidarity, social justice, emancipation. Now, in light of that multidimensional definition of critical philosophy, the different modalities of genealogy should be understood not as different methods or types, but rather as different elements of a critical philosophy. Let me take two examples, problematization and debunking. Problematization is an integral part of the second and fourth elements, the importance of mental constructs that govern how we understand the world and the need to unmask illusions. What problematization does is to show us that something that we take for granted, something that's common sense, something that's received wisdom is actually in fact deeply problematic and may lead us astray. This is precisely what the second ideational element of critical philosophy is all about. What we are doing is problematizing our common sense and understanding, and in the process unveiling what we might call ideologies or illusions. We are turning what used to be received wisdom into a problem, and that, of course, is the core of the fourth element of critical philosophy. Now, there is no doubt, and uh, Amy Allen and, and Colin Koopman are entirely right, that problematization is at the heart of the Foucauldian and the Deleuzian projects. There's no doubt that Foucault was constantly engaged in problematizing things, madness, punishment, sexuality, social science, the clinic. It's also the case that Foucault favored problematization over providing answers. And in this respect, again, uh, Koopman is entirely right. There is, there is a difference between problematization and the Hegelian dialectic. Hegel, Hegel's dialectic seeks forms of resolution, works through those forms of resolution. If we think of the dialectic itself as an interaction of a problematization and a resolution, Hegel no doubt favored the moment of resolution, whereas Foucault emphasized the moment of problematization. Kupin constructs problematization, although uh, carefully, uh, as a conflict between Nietzsche and Hegel. Um, this serves to structure the contrast between Deleuze and Foucault on the one hand, Hegel and Dorno on the other, between problematization on the one hand versus contradictions and imminent tensions on the other. As a technical matter, I differ in my reading of Adorno. I think that his negative dialectics brings him much closer to Foucault, and it's precisely because of Adorno's refusal of the resolution in Hegelian dialectics that he and Foucault share such sensibilities. But at a, at a broader level, I would argue, the tension should not be exacerbated, but rather worked with, in a way harmonized. These are two moments of the critical work we must do. They are not so much competing or opposing or mutually exclusive philosophical methods, as they are different moments that we toggle between in critical philosophy, and that Michel Foucault himself toggled between. Let's think for a minute about, second, debunking genealogies. I would say they constitute an element of the fourth as well as the fifth and sixth dimensions of a critical philosophy. Debunking is essentially unveiling an illusion, revealing that our common sense understanding is detrimental in such a way as to stimulate judgment and action and to lead us to reject that illusion. Debunking should not be reduced to a genealogical fallacy, uh, the idea that because something has poisoned its roots, it should be abandoned. Uh, it shouldn't be reduced to the genealogical fallacy and, and thereby dismissed. First, because the genealogical fallacy is really not a fallacy, but rather a legitimate modality of critique. The discovery of dark origins is a legitimate reason to problematize a practice or institution. So, for instance, today, uh, in the current debates over uh, prison industrial complex abolition. Many have traced the police and the roots of policing in the United States to slave patrols. That raises a legitimate question about the police that should problematize the institution. We shouldn't reject it simply because it's a gene 
genealogical fallacy. We should prepare we should be prepared to use dark histories to raise questions about contemporary relations of power. And of course, many critical thinkers do. Samuel Moyne's work on the history of international human rights is a debunking genealogy in the sense that he shows that the emergence and eventual dominance of the human rights paradigm has effectively sapped the revolutionary and radical leftist potential from the movement. It's a debunking move because it then makes us question the value or potential of the paradigm. But in addition, debunking genealogies do not really reduce to the taint of the poisonous origin. They also point forward to praxis and emancipation, the fifth and sixth dimensions of critical philosophy. And while we're on the topic, it's worth emphasizing that Nietzsche was not only engaged in debunking, that was just one facet of his philosophical intervention in his critical philosophy. He was constructing as well. He was constructing an ethic of life, of vitality, of action, a philosophy of the will. He was not debunking morality too cool or suggesting that we should have no morality or ethics. He was not arguing for a position beyond good and bad, but beyond good and evil. He explained that well at the end of the first essay on the genealogy of morals, you'll recall where he ends. Reason enough for me to come to an end, assuming it has long since been abundantly clear that my aim, what my aim is, what the aim of that dangerous slogan is that is inscribed at the head of my last book, Beyond Good and Evil. At least, this does not mean beyond good and bad. In any event, um, the bottom line on this first ground clearing is that we should Think of the types of genealogical work as elements of a critical philosophy that can work together toward the goal of action. This is true as well of problematizing genealogy, um, which is integral to the fifth and sixth elements of a critical philosophy. I'm sorry, possibilizing genealogy, I meant to say, right? Possibilizing genealogies can open normative possibilities for resistance and change. Uh, it's true as well of validating genealogies that serve to recuperate practices or institutions. And in fact, that is what Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Myers, and Ritchie do in their genealogical work. They vindicate earlier practices and organizing of abolition feminism. Okay, second ground clearing. Foucault does problematize, no doubt, and a lot. That may well have been his preferred sensibility. One of the most powerful passages to this effect is from his lectures uh, in Berkeley, uh, edited by Daniele uh, in uh, 1983, Discourse and Truth, which were published after uh, Colin Koopman's uh, book, The Genealogy as Critique, in 2013, where Foucault says, this is at the conclusion of those lectures, from the methodological point of view, I would like to underline the following theme. As you may have noticed, I heavily insisted in this seminar on the word problematization. I used it thousands and thousands of times without providing you with any necessary explanation. But what I've tried to do from the beginning was to analyze problematization. From the beginning, he says, right? To analyze problematization, that is, how and why certain things, conducts, phenomena, processes become a problem. Now in those final pages, Foucault discusses his approach to problematization, and, uh, and there's no question uh, that it was at the forefront of his philosophical intervention. In fact, he even wrote in, those, in his lecture notes, uh, but he didn't ultimately deliver, uh, that the task of critique is what he calls, quote, permanent reproblematization, unquote. So yes, Foucault was into problematizing things, possibly to a fault, in the sense that sometimes I would argue it undermined rather than augmented or invigorated our action. But his problematizations were never neutral, as Colin Koopman suggests. And in this respect, I agree entirely with Daniele Lorenzini. Um, in his book and in his research, Koopman draws comparisons between the different types of genealogy in such a way as to suggest that Foucault's form of problematizing genealogy is essentially neutral, non-normative, apolitical, 
uh, Koopman writes that it is a form of genealogy that is neither for nor against the practices it inquires into, but is rather an attempt to clarify and intensify the difficulties that enable and disable those practices. Now, the notions of for and against Koopman ties to the distinction between vindicatory genealogy and debunking genealogy. The first is for, while the second is against the object of the inquiry. By contrast, according to Foucault, to Koopman, Foucault was putting forward genealogies, quote, under a critical modality that aims to be neither for nor against. Um, Foucault aimed for a certain kind of neutrality. Of course, as Koopman writes, granted that no philosopher can be neutral about everything, there is still room for the philosopher to aim to remain neutral about some things. Now, I would argue that Foucault was never neutral in his problematization. He never chose his objects of genealogical study in a neutral way. In each case, the prison, sexuality, the modern subject, there was a normative, personal, and deeply political motivation. In each case, his choice of objects and his critiques were motivated for change, whether for desubjectification uh, or for others possibly to use. Recall, Foucault wrote his little book on the prison for users, not readers. So in this respect, I depart from Colin Koopman's analysis, at least the thrust of it, uh, reflected in the very first opening sentence of his great book uh, on genealogy as critique. Ge he writes, genealogies articulate problems, but not just any problems. Genealogies are concerned rather with submerged problems. The problems of genealogy are those problems found below the surface of our lives, the problems whose itches feel impenetrable, whose remedies are ever just beyond our grasp, and whose very articulations require a severe work of thought. I beg to differ. The genealogists do not, first and foremost, foremost, articulate problems. They must lead to action. And when they do not, they are of no use. Um, there are other passages there that uh, I take issue with. Um, Koopman writes that my main claim in this book, following but also extending the work of Foucault, is that genealogy at its best involves a practice of critique in the form of a historical problematization of the present. I would say at its best, it involves a practice of critique and praxis. Now, um, and of course, when I, when I look at all of the work that was done around the prison with the sheep, the intolerable tracks, the lectures on the punitive society, I have no doubt that the genealogical method augmented and directly invigorated our activity, normative through and through. Ground clearing three. While the problematization modality of genealogy always has an engaged ethical dimension, and in this sense, I agree with Daniele Lorenzini, I am not convinced that the normativity is internal to the genealogical method. And here I need to have a, a longer and continuing conversation with Daniele, um, which we will. Um, when Daniele writes in his essay uh, on possibilizing genealogy that, quote, I will be in a position to argue that Foucauldian genealogy possesses sui generis normative force, I'm not entirely convinced yet. Um, and even when Daniele hedges his bets somewhat and writes that, although it does not tell us precisely what to do or where to go, it creates a concrete political framework for action, a political we, that commits us to resist arbitrariness of the power knowledge formation it reveals, again, I'm not entirely persuaded. Um, the emphasis here and uh, as, as our conversations will continue uh, with Daniele, is on a framework for action, if I understand, and the creation of a political we. And um, I fear that the genealogical method 
does not provide within itself the normative direction that we would need to assess even that we. Now, of course, few, if any, methods do. Perhaps none do. We need most often to reach outside our methods to find our values, which is, of course, why we need a radical critical philosophy of values. But the truth is that all of these modalities of genealogy can and have been used by dark figures just as easily as by critical philosophers. Donald Trump and Steve Bannon have been wizards at genealogical work. So have the European men of the new right. I'd also say that I'm somewhat skeptical that counterconduct has a normative dimension internal to possibilizing genealogy, um, as I think Daniele suggests at time. Now, I will confess that I am personally drawn to the concept of counterconduct. In fact, like Foucault, I'm deeply seduced by the idea of counterconduct. I'm drawn to desubjectification. I am partial to les hommes et femmes infâmes, to Herculean Barbin, to Pierre Riviere. It's not for nothing that I've dedicated my life to men and women on death row. I, too, am drawn to the margins, to the liminal, to transgression. But it's not always productive in cases where, even in cases where there are dominant forces, domination to a point beyond the ordinary struggle of relations of power. Counterconduct is, is deeply seductive, but it has to be placed in context, and that context does not reduce even to an imbalance in relations of power. To give an example, and we spoke about it earlier, anti-vaxxers are engaged in counterconduct. That was, of course, Giorgio Agamben's problem at the beginning of the pandemic the knee-jerk reaction to be against, which I confess I often have, that knee-jerk reaction has to be scrutinized. And relations of power are not the simple answer. In other words, in the context of the pandemic, the anti-vaxxers were a small minority. In terms of relations of power, truth be told, they were and have been crushed by forms of biopower and discipline that took place. They were the abnormal. They were the transgressive. But even that is not enough to suggest that anti-vaxxing was or is a proper form of counterconduct. Counterconduct may be seductive, but it can also kill us. So in conclusion, the transgressive is deeply seductive, but it gets its meaning in context, in the context, for instance, of neoliberalism today or of bourgeois society in the 19th century, in other contexts, for instance, in the collective movements like abolition feminism or the jeep, I take it, we would not engage in counterconduct against abolition feminism, but would build something together. In this sense, um, I feel we shouldn't get carried away by our critical methods. Let's always remember we always need to place them in relation to praxis, as I know Daniele Lorenzini does. And it's important here to recognize that everything that surrounds us is the product of genealogies. Every institution and praxis, practice, has meanings based on stories we tell about them. We usually do not recognize this because those stories have become naturalized, they become common sense. But all of the stories, you know, and this is the second element of critical philosophy, shape and constitute how we see the world and live in it. Those origin stories and tales are no different than the intentional critical genealogies that we critical thinkers trace in our philosophical world. You could take the example of the prison again, right? The commonly shared understanding that the modern prison is the product of humanistic reformism of the 18th century and the Age of Enlightenment that's received wisdom, we take it for granted, that's a genealogical explanation. Carceral practices emerged as a result of a social transformation towards enlightenment. It's not a history, it's a genealogy. And yet it's the one that, the one that 
needed to be problematized, right? In other words, we're engaged in genealogical work all the time, even though we don't see it. All of our existing understandings are genealogical in that sense. Shaped meanings, origin stories. It's not as if we, we do genealogy as critical theorists on a blank slate. Our genealogical work is to highlight other origin stories than those that are commonly understood in order, in order to nourish our action. All right, then, with the ground cleared, then I'm going to make 10 quick points about the genealogical method. Some of these have already been established, so I can go quickly, and I hope you'll bear with me. I'll take about 10 more minutes. First, it's important not to reify genealogy or turn it into a sacred cow. It's important to always and constantly remember that what we are trying to do is to use critical histories to promote praxis, or even more humbly, to use critical stories to promote justice. Here, the English language presents an opportunity to distinguish between histories and stories, which is not true in every language. It's certainly not true in French. In French, stories is the same word as histories. One tells stories, but one does histories. In French, one dit des histoires, on fait de l'histoire, or today, because of the genealogical turn, on écrit des histoires, des histoires, au pluriel. But in English, there is a way to distinguish the two. And at times, it's important to bring critical theory back down to earth and suggest, perhaps, that what we are doing is telling stories rather than doing history. That's, of course, what Foucault recognized when he conceded happily that he was always writing fiction. Now, that gets very distorted by the right and by liberals. It's a delicate, complicated claim to make, and he explains it beautifully in his conversations with Duccio Trombadori, uh, in uh, 1978 in the Remarks on Marx, and I'll let you uh, reread those. Um, uh, but what's important here, of course, is that um, uh, the genealogical method is really closely associated to telling stories, uh, or what, call, what Foucault calls fictions. And it's led, of course, to a remarkable remarkable intellectual generative domain of work that's been called by some like Sadia Hartman critical fabulation um, and by others Sarah Haley uh, who bring to the object and the silences in the archive a much fuller story. All right, second, the genealogical enterprise is born of a desire for action. I don't need to say anything more. Third, and at the same time, the genealogical enterprise is born of a critique of what Nietzsche called the historical sense that leads us so often to neutralize our historical work and to push history towards a science. It is precisely against those tendencies that Nietzsche originally wrote. It's those tendencies that Foucault explored so powerfully in his Nietzsche lectures uh, at Vincennes in 1969, 1970. And it was against those tendencies that Nietzsche developed the notion of a critical history as one form of historical method that privileges judgment and critique. Fourth, it's important to emphasize with Foucault that the nomenclature of genealogy arrives late in Nietzsche's work, really at the time of the genealogy of morals, and that it is not intended to be a separate method so much as the use of history for life. Fifth, it's important to remember that the term is picked up by Foucault at a particular juncture in his intellectual life, when he is turning greater emphasis on two questions uh, of relations of power, uh, and when he is uh, more so than at other points in his life actively engaged in praxis. He turns to genealogy at a historical moment in time surrounding the May 68 students and the movement revolution and its uh, wake um, and the student movements and other movements that followed in the early 1970s, particularly his work on dismantling the prison. He turns to the notions of heredity, of dynasty, of genealogy as a way to negotiate a few problems in his own work, one of which was the static nature of archaeological layers of knowledge and the lack of a theory of transition from one epistemic layer to another. Another dimension was the need to grasp the fluidity and transformations of relations of power as they shape our knowledge. 
but it's important to emphasize that he became attached to the term at a particular moment as a way of presenting and expressing his philosophical approach, and that it becomes, as a result, a recurring discourse and point of reference that, perhaps somewhat unfortunately, becomes somewhat reified because of the constant return to a periodic self-understanding. Sixth, it is essential now to subject the genealogical discourse to the very same question that Nietzsche asked of history. Is it being used in a productive way? Is it encouraging action? Um, it has become so prevalent today, so dominant, um, that it has eclipsed history. And now more and more, uh, we need to ensure uh, that it continues to perform its task. Seventh, genealogies today are not always useful for action. They can sometimes be debilitating. The reason is that the work of demonstrating how a particular way of living or thinking has become dominant, such as neoliberalism, can itself become oppressive. And here, since I always prefer to criticize myself than others, um, I at times grow concerned that my own work, for instance, on what I call the counter-revolution, uh, the emergence of a form of governing that is modeled on counterinsurgency warfare practices uh, in the United States, has or can become so totalizing and frightening that it begins to demobilize. Tony Negri, more than anyone, has always warned us of the dangers of spending too much time tracing the rise of oppression and domination, not a sufficient amount of time tracing histories of resistance and transformation. And while Foucault and everyone is undoubtedly right that there is no domination without resistance, there is no power without counterpower, Tony Negri is undoubtedly right that some of our histories of the present may spend too much time on the domination and not sufficiently theorize forms of resistance. Eight, I would argue that Angela Davis, Dent, Miners, and Ritchie offer an exemplar of what genealogical work could do. They call it critical genealogy, with the word critical added before the term genealogy, and what they focus on, their mission, is to nurture and encourage more movement work. And to do so, they show that the abolition of movement today has its origins in the various feminist organizing that took place over the past few decades. They are trying to highlight all the feminist work, feminist abolitionist work that has been done over time and that has accumulated over time to give rise to an abolitionist feminist movement today. In part, they are trying to spotlight, highlight, underscore all of the work of women in the abolitionist movement. And by contrast to other ways of narrating and recounting the movement for black lives that may emphasize black male leadership, for instance, the Black Panthers, George Jackson, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they trace the movement back to feminist interventions. In the process, what they're able to do is to bestow value on those earlier actions, to place value on them in order to stimulate and encourage and foster and support and nurture more feminist abolitionist organizing. A lot of their effort is to show that all of that organizing may have felt like failure at the time um, and was treated as failure at the time. Uh, small organizations may have collapsed, right? Um, someone might have gotten fired, might have been internal dissension. Uh, the group didn't have as much effect as it has hoped. But what they write is that those weren't failures. Those were pieces that together have given birth to, in the summer of 2020, a movement for black lives that was the largest number of protesters in American history on the streets and an incredible global movement as well. Um, as they write, those early movements 20 years ago, abolition feminist organizations, small, little, corpuscules, quote, they deserve to be recognized as harbingers of a radical shift. And I think that that's precisely the critical genealogy, the use of critical genealogy that highlights different origin stories for today's movements um, uh, and, uh, and eliminate those erasures and make way for uh, action. Nine, uh, I think uh, we need to return to some foundational critical insights and once again, do philosophy with a hammer, a sounding hammer that tests whether our genealogies are productive or counterproductive. Um, we need to take a slightly different approach to the genealogical problem, perhaps, 
be somewhat, maybe less professionalized in our philosophical taxonomies, but oriented once again to practice. We need to not cabin, limit, define, but instead demonstrate how the multiplicity can be used collectively as ways to promote action. And finally, 10, we need to always be aware of the potential slippage of the term genealogy itself. In any metaphorical use of terms, there are dangers. Gene genealogy is deeply tied to the notion of genetics. As you know, it derives from the Latin word genus, birth, race, stock. It is inextricably tied to conception, reproduction, generations, biology. In fact, it's, in a way, it's inextricably turned, to, tied to, to eggs and sperm. And in order to avoid that slippage back to biological institutions, I think it's especially important that we qualify what we have in mind by genealogy and that we qualify it with the word critical. So in conclusion, I would say that at least with regard to my own project and my own work, the term I would like to use following Davis, Dent, Miners, and Ritchie, and others, would be critical genealogies in the plural, with the use of the term critical to qualify those genealogies that are useful for action. The term critical here draws in part from Nietzsche and his use of critical histories. It also draws from Foucault's use of the term critical history of thought. You'll recall as the masked Foucault wrote about himself in his own entry in the Dictionary of Philosophers, he wrote under a pseudonym, quote, if Foucault is indeed perfectly at home in the philosophical tradition, his project could be called the critical history of thought. I would only propose that we augment that and add action. So our project would be the critical history of thought and praxis, or the critical history of critique and praxis. What I would add then, the only thing I would add, is that for me the project going forward is to very self-consciously and carefully engage in critical histories of thought and practice, or critical histories of critique and praxis, or to borrow Angela Davis's term and Gina Dent and Miners and Ritchie to engage in critical genealogies. Maybe I'll end with Nietzsche. Quote, for those who employ critical history for the sake of life. Thank you. Let me just clarify something in case I, I was uh, not clear. Um, I, I don't think I was suggesting that critical genealogies that there's a contrast here between the object, that it's simply a question of the object, which you were, which I think I was hearing in the way you were formulating the question, as between submerged problems that we don't see, right, genealogies of those or, or something, versus genealogies of action. Um, so... That leads action. That leads action. Right, so that leads... I, I, I heard you. That lead to action. Right, 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 right. I mean, in both cases, I mean, in, I think we would, we would, we would need, we need, we need both. I mean, we do need genealogies of submerged problems. That, that is what, you, that, that is genealogical work. I mean, submerged in the sense that oftentimes illusions are hidden, right? I mean, or, or just understood. I mean, my favorite that I've worked on a lot is the illusion of free markets. I think that that is a, submerged and, and merged, I mean, but it's it's so deeply ingrained that part of the iceberg is 
above and part of the iceberg is below. But I, I definitely think we, we need to be engaged in, in that practice. All of it, though, needs to be oriented, as Nietzsche was suggesting, towards nourishing our activity. All right, so then, what is action? Do we need a genealogy of action? I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I would go there. Um, although, you know, you might be able to convince me. But um, I don't know if that is where I would go. That, the relationship to action is a relationship to values. What is the value of values? Nietzsche asked. I think it is action. It is will. It is transformation of self. Possibly of others. And that's where that gets gauged or evaluated in relationship to values which I do not that which I do not think are internal to the genealogy um, and this is where we might differ um, and I don't I don't even think are are are, are in a very can't be reduced simply to relations of power, although relations of power is is the medium within which we need to analyze them. Um, and so, um, and so, in my work, I've generally drawn on the values that have been integral to the kind of critical, the strand of critical philosophy that I feel a part of, uh, starting with Marx and going to the present, uh, which are values of cooperation, solidarity, equality, what I call social justice, emancipation. Um, and those I find in the current of critical philosophy of which I consider myself a part. Anything want to leave things up? Yeah, unfortunately, our, our time is over. Um, thank you, Bernard, for, for this All right. talk.